All right, welcome to our second to last Art History Tuesday. I started off with music from 1960s, so this is in the era of art history in which your grandparents can probably remember. I don't know quite the age of your grandparents, but they were probably around the 60s. I know I'm bumming to our second to last session together. Um, it's been a wild ride, but we're nearing current day in terms of art history. Um, uh, so this is just a reminder for the exam exemption policy for elective courses. Um, there is a final exam in art appreciation. It is not difficult. Um, as long as you work to complete the requirements, you will do fine on it. Um, but if you have an A for the year, you will be exempted. It's pretty straightforward and easy. Um, and my class in particular, we're working to try and submit everything by the end of this month. So that's that 431 date, um, which is August 430 date, which is on a Tuesday, but technically it's really until May 3rd. Um, does this include honors, um, the exam exemption, or you mean that due date? Um, I'm saying that that is the goal date for honors, but after I close out with all the, all the normal students to see um, what we have to turn in, I'm going to talk with honor students one on one. Sorry, one second. Sorry about that. I have the uh, window open on this beautiful day. We're going to need that the dogs can hear each other even better as they bark across the street. Okay. <laughs> At least that you won't bark right next to our ears. <laughs> the pros and cons of teaching and learning from home. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So, yeah, we're going to say May 3rd is a soft due date for honors, um, but a hard due date for all the other material. Um, and basically, May is dedicated to taking SOLs. And um, let's see. Oh, gosh. Can I go close? health is thoroughly protected. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> so May is dedicated to SOL testing and um, uh, we will have one project left which is voluntary but I'm going to strongly recommend anyone who's a borderline student so A, B, B, C um, if you're within a few points that you do this project and um, also won't hurt any of them score if they do it either. Um, and then of course there is the exam, which I'm talking with our principal right now about if y'all could take that a little bit earlier rather than later. All right, the essential question for this week is how does an artist use pop culture? That's a great response. Yes, they would use imagery and symbols um, that we would all understand from pop culture. All right. So just as always, you choose one line, I'll choose the other. So you can tell me what is happening in this image. Mm -hmm. So we see color manipulation on the face, and then I'm going to describe this other as 
replicated image. So this image is printed over and over again, but in a variety of different um, colors and styles. What makes you wonder about this piece? Have you seen this before, by the way? No, you see it. So it's new to you. You've never seen it. OK, cool. Perfect. Yes. Why did they choose to repeat the same image and why the different colors? You are spot on. So the name of this artwork is called Marilyn Monroe, but your artist is Andy Warhol. This is important that I split this up because I can't tell you how many times I've had students who misunderstood and thought the artist was Marilyn Monroe, <laughs> like she had done a self-portrait or something. And no, Marilyn Monroe had already been dead for 20 years before this piece was made. And your artist here is Andy Warhol. Um, so this piece is, in fact, all about printing and replication, and believe it or not, in a huge way about um, fair use in copyright law. So at this point, in the 1960s, um, copyright law was much more in the hands of the consumer. Um, I believe it was 13 years, and or maybe about 20 at that point, in which um, if it's already been on the market for 20 years, it can become fair use. The artist here, Andy Warhol, has taken an image of Marilyn Monroe from her heyday in an old newspaper, and he silk screens, the screen printed this image over and over and over again. So kind of like what you would see on T-shirts, where they do um, silk screen process. This is the same thing here. It's a printed image in which you can see the one thing that's consistent over and over again is that black hair lines and the lines around the faces. But the colors with the hair and the skin tone in the background keep changing. And that changes with every batch. Andy Warhol was obsessed with machine manufacturing and our pop culture and our obsession with um, material goods. And this piece, um, uh, he was honestly very obsessed with like factory culture and manufacturing to the point that his own art studio was even called the factory. In the 1960s, Andy Warhol actually attracted a whole bunch of celebrities, and intellectuals, bands, and musicians to his art space. And um, it was kind of like a club that People were also making things. I mean, like, you know, like a dance club, sort of. Um, there were lots of wild parties there, and yet people were also always working around the clock. Um, Andy Warhol also made um, a series of sculptures where he literally built cardboard boxes by hand and printed the logo of Brillo, like a Brillo pad, like the sponges that you use to clean your kitchen um, on these boxes. And they looked the exact same as a factory and made box, except for he was selling them for thousands upon thousands of dollars. Um, so Andy Warhol was a genius at commercialism as well. So he would take things from pop culture, like images of Marilyn Monroe, and then package them, essentially repackage them in a way in which he was expecting people to buy them again. Do you think this kind of artist was accepted at first? Probably not, no. But he quickly became an international sensation. And even though, you know, even today, people still don't agree with the work that he makes, um, but he is accepted as an impactful artist, even if people do not like his art. 
he kind of became um, the hub for most trendy things and was even a, a videographer, he made music, he worked in all different kinds of materials. A.D. Warhol was also a known sort of recluse. He was in like the spotlight all the time and yet people didn't know fully a lot about him. He purposely dyed his hair like a silver gray and wore dark sunglasses so no one really ever knew his age because he had already like uh, made his hair look gray so it was hard to tell. Um, yeah, and uh, let's see, he was also a very sick child and his original inspiration in art actually came from comic books back in like the 40s and 50s. Um, his family would bring him co uh, comic books as well. I believe he's also has Pol he's also his family is from Poland, and when he moved to the U.S. Um, and he uh, got a career in art, he said that his name didn't sound American enough. His original name was Andy Warhol, and then he just took the A off and made it Warhol, so it, it was a little bit snazzier. So even his name is a sort of branding. Um, so. I have a little clip of the artist here if you would like to watch. And this is an interview about some of his pieces, I believe, from the 70s. And we'll start our timer. Yeah, his response is you always expect him to be kind of egotistical, like he knows how great he is, but in fact he almost is always super humble and like tells you outwardly like, oh, I was just making it up, or oh, I had no ideas. Um, so uh, it's really surprising because he breaks a lot of rules in the art world, and he knows he does too. Um, so kind of coming off of, of this, Andy Warhol's, um, I should say, demise in quotes, um, he still lived a pretty long life. Um, as I said, he was a sickly child and um, he had some on again, off again illnesses throughout his adulthood. But I believe in the late 60s, early 70s, there was actually a movie that came out uh, years ago called I Shot Andy Warhol. And it's about um, a woman who is a playwright that started to hang around Andy Warhol's um, factory studio and kept trying to get Andy Warhol to make her famous. And he didn't like her work and honestly didn't like her. She wasn't very interesting to him. And she had a breakdown and stole a gun and shot Andy Warhol and then walked out into the street and handed her gun over to a policeman and said, I shot Andy Warhol. So she turned herself in right away. Um, Andy Warhol actually um, survived this, but um, as you can imagine, he's already kind of sickly, um, and medical care was good, but nowhere near our standards today of overcoming gunshot wounds. Um, so he kind of petered out in fame shortly after that. He stopped having a whole lot of energy to create his own work and um, actually began to mentor others which takes us to this next work here. Um, so we're seeing a big jump in culture 
this very trendy image from the 1960s, a uh, very commercial. Um, actually, if you go to Urban Outfitters, they still print this image on t-shirts and bags all the time. This next mural here um, is also not so subtle, uh, but this is actually painted by um, one of the, I wouldn't say students, but protégés of Andy Warhol. So he worked to help this um, man rise to his fame that he had during his lifetime. All right, so this is a less subtle image <laughs> for sure. Um, so if you can choose one line, I'll choose the other, and we'll figure out what is happening in this piece. Ooh, textured letters, yes. And the textured letters spell out um, a phrase that was trendy back then, but now actually sounds um, like you're not so cool anymore. Crack is whack. Um, and you can see here in the upper right hand corner, we even know where we are. This is painted at NYC on 1986. And I'm going to say for here, um, we're seeing literally no money. Um, so the morals of drugs. So he's, this is a cautionary tale that you're looking at here for sure. What makes you wonder about this piece? As I said, it's not so subtle. What's going on with all the little people? I totally agree there. So this title of this mural is Crack is Wax by Keith Haring. And um, we're seeing uh, sort of these androgynous, just like bathroom figures even, right? Like what you see on a bathroom sign. Um, and this is definitely a core of Keith Haring's style. Um, he could paint these murals very quickly. Some took only a few hours, some took only a day. Um, he was a very fast and productive artist. He painted legally and illegally all over New York City, but he also had a, um, a store in which he sold artwork, kind of like you would like t-shirts or jewelry or something, um, called a pop shop. <laughs> so he took um, Andy Warhol's concepts and commercialized them even further. But he also did um, things that weren't commercial, like posters or uh, murals like this. So um, all those little people are kind of just what you're talking about, representing people in general. Keith Haring is also inspired by um, comic books, just like Andy Warhol was. And we can definitely see that here with these action lines that are around the faces and the people. Um, these little lines everywhere truly really make things look chaotic, but you're seeing a horde of people here climbing and carrying a skeleton who's um, holding drug paraphernalia in this zero dollar uh, symbol, and the big message up here, crack is whack. So can you guess what epidemic has taken over um, inner city in New York in 1986? drugs, for sure. The crack epidemic has exploded. Uh, this is a point in which you first hear this phrase, crack is whack, and you start seeing celebrities go on TV in the 80s. Um, uh, so, you know, even like Mr. T starts to say, I pity the fool who does drugs. Um, this is a huge war on drugs that's really taken off, like that it was also started in the Reagan era. 
um, in his presidency. So um, do you think, looking at this, that Keith Haring is for or against drugs? Definitely against, right. So he's passionately against it, and um, the drug community really didn't only it just affect the inner city, but it also um, hugely affected the artist community, um, kind of the same way in which opioids are affecting everyone today. Um, it seems that everyone knows someone that, uh, or knows of someone that has been affected by the opioid crisis because it just is so pervasive. The same thing was happening in the 80s with just the different drugs. Um, yeah, so Keith Haring, um, as I said, uh, did, could work very quickly. And it's because he had this very clean style of just brush black, uh, black line. And then sometimes he would, he would actually paint in figures. And uh, he was a very active artist and creative work at all times. Um, and in the next video you'll see um, that I give you, they'll actually show you his pop shop. But where would a mural artist like him get his start in the art world? Or not in the art world. But people all over New York saw his images all the time. And that's kind of like the one place that almost all New Yorkers go. Where they need to use this place. You're not sure? Um, let's see. It's too big of a city to walk everywhere, and cabs are too expensive for everyone. Subway, yeah, exactly. So Keith Haring actually was known for riding around the subway, getting off the at different stops, because um, at this time you could ride the subway indefinitely. Um, uh, you just put like a quarter or less than that as you walked in and then didn't have to pay any money until you left the subway. Uh, so literally there was a whole community of people. People could actually live down there at that time and obviously uh, they had policed that pretty much out of possibility. But Keith Haring would get off at these different stops and find poster areas in which like a poster or a billboard has been taken down and it was just a big blank piece of wall. And he would use chalk or a paint pen or a sharpie and draw his little um, and draw figures like this and images like this um, in these small spaces. But very quickly, he could do a drawing in under two minutes, no problem, uh, to get his message out. And people all over New York started seeing them everywhere. Right. So, what's the what's the problem with that though? Like he doesn't own that space or didn't get that permission. Um, everyone enjoyed them, but yeah, it was still illegal. So even if the cop liked his work or agreed with his message, he still would have had to arrest him. And Keith Haring was arrested a lot. Um, but he ended up getting enough money from his uh, secondary job, his pop shop, that he um, almost never had to remain in jail for very long. So if you can click on the link here. Um, it actually shows a retro video of um, uh, the news interviewing him and walking him or walking around with him kind of on his daily life. Let me double check the time here on his video. Good grammar and spelling. Oh no, it's just bad. Okay. So I'll put it down at three minutes. You're welcome to skip, your, skip around if you want to. It was a long ad that came up. Yeah, right. Um, he's not quite as like uh, dismissive as um, uh, his predecessor, but he is. You know, he seems like a, a pretty realistic person, right? 
especially seeing the videos with like his sleeveless shirts and his giant glasses on, you feel like you might know a guy like that. Um, and he's uh, and he's pretty relaxed to, too. Um, he was he made a huge impact on the art world, and um, especially the graffiti and the muralist side of the world. In fact, he was one of the artists that represented the U.S. when we tore down the Berlin Wall. There's actually a segment of it that still stands in which there's a mural of his um, uh, about connecting the world together. So he made, um, you know, he was big enough that even the president asked him to represent our, our country um, abroad in huge political matters. Um, sadly, uh, he and many people at, the, at this era in the art world uh, was affected by AIDS which um, a lot of people don't talk about this, but it, AIDS really destroyed a huge portion of the art community in the U.S. Um, really through the 70s and 80s. There's a huge portion that died way too young of death, um, like in their 30s, because of that epidemic. So that was happening at the same time, of course, as the crack epidemic, except for at least with crack there was um, a way to help people. Um, but at this point, there was no medicine out there that could help with the HIV AIDS crisis. Um, and now we have um, steps to help with that in a huge way, and it's gone down so dramatically. It's still not you know, fully healed, but someone could contract HIV and live a full life now, um, where that wasn't a possibility back in the 80s. In fact, that was such a big deal that even in musicals like Rent and such, that became a subject matter um, in which like a, a huge portion of the art community was affected. Okay, so your honors question for this week is, does an artist risk, an artist risk their reputation if they commercialize their work? This is a fancy way. Some artists actually used to say this, especially in bands and stuff. Um, another word that they would call this would be selling out. So like picking up a big label, um, having their music appear in jingles and ads and such. So do an artist really risk their reputation if they commercialize their work? And maybe there's a difference too. Like like in the 90s or the 80s versus today, do we have different feelings about this? This might be another thinker as well. Okay, so our, we'll call this one M and we'll call this one D for short. Let's see here. And if you're ready, we can move on. Cool. 
So we'll compare and contrast. This is interesting because we're kind of seeing the teacher and the student almost in the same claim this time. Nice. Yeah, there's never really any movement in um, Andy Warhol's pieces. It's a good thing to bring up. And I said here they both use some relevant subject matter. So they are both about things that the viewer would already have know something about. Cool. We'll move forward. Impact. So how do you think one or both of these works has affected the art world? And I realize now that I probably should have said A factor instead of E factor. It's only at this point in the course. We're nearing the end, and I think I realized that. <laughs> How does work affect the art world? <laughs> All right, you're right. So <laughs> there's no grammar person out there that was like, hey. Yeah, they were both super famous for their lifetime. And um, I'm going to say here, too, that regular people understood their work. Which, which was a big deal for the time, too. Because they were using symbols and languages that other people could figure out pretty easily. All right. And lastly, how does this one or both affect you? I'm going to turn off the recording. <laughs>